Welcome to The Susan Brender Show. It's all about you. Featuring shows on health and wellness, the performing arts, politics, and people who inspire you to be your very best. And now, here's Susan Brender. I'm Susan Brender, and this is The Susan Brender Show. You know, it's always interesting to bring on my show a person of great accomplishment, and that's what this person is. His name is Patrick Henry Tyrants, who was born uh, in Baltimore, Maryland. His parents taught him the value of faith and generosity. He moved to Nebraska, to Omaha, where he finished school and attended the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. He competed for the football team, earning an all-conference and all-American honor in consecutive years. A member of the NCAA Academic Hall of Fame, he was one of the most recognized students, athlete outstanding academic and uh, athletic achievements. Now, after that, he was selected in the NFL draft and had a brief stint with the Los Angeles Rams. We're going to talk a little bit about that. It's very interesting, and I think our audience really wants to know a little bit more about that. Later on, he attended Harvard Medical School, Harvard Kennedy Schools. He completed an orthopedic surgery surgery residency training at Harvard and later uh, got an MBA in public policy from George Washington University. You know, right now he is a orthopedic surgeon in Florida and and I think it's making me tired thinking about your schedule, um, Patrick, but I'm so delighted that you're on the Susan Brenda show. So welcome to my show. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you having you know, me, Susan. Yeah. You know, so we started um, talking about your accomplishments, but you don't get that kind of ability unless you have reinforcement. And in your particular case, it sounds like Patrick and Geraldine, your parents, really gave you the, the sense that it is very important, very important to have faith and generosity. Is that true? And what, how did they give you that, uh, that feeling that you really need to have those kinds of things, faith and generosity? Yes, I, I think it is true, and they they not only emphasize it in their words, but they more importantly emphasize it in their their actions. And I saw my my dad, you know, get up early in the morning and and go to work every day. Uh, oftentimes, uh, doing jobs on the weekends. My parents also stress the importance of education. Uh, my mother is a classically trained pianist and played for the Baltimore Symphony uh, course for uh, a number of years. And oftentimes their, their efforts and their actions were um, giving to others, helping out neighbors, uh, being involved in the community, in the, in the church. And we were, I would say a, a working class family and, and, you know, every day was, a new day and a day uh, in which we were to be a little bit better than we were yesterday and mm. the expectation. Yeah. Where did that come from? Because today we, we're dealing with so many young people who are having babies and, um, you know, as teenagers and they, their ethics and their morals and the things that we see on TV and in books and in all, even online, I mean, even tremendous amount mm-hmm. online of negativity and of things that are really something that people should not be uh, involved in, but they are. And so... How do you? What do you attribute to your parents? Sure. Um, is it the education, really, which was primary to your wanting to be somebody very special, as I mentioned earlier in the show? Uh, again, I, I think it's a combination. The, the issues that you described can be um, can, uh, you can point to a number of uh, sources, whether it be mainstream media, uh, young individuals, young people not having um, immediate role models, such as uh, their parents, oftentimes behaviors and values and uh, ways of um, being in the world, the way, uh, the way in which we handle stress, uh, the way in which we conduct ourselves, uh, that is modeled by, by parents. And uh, certainly uh, technology in part has, you know, plays a role. You know, there's a lot of 
uh, great things out there but I, um, in which to occupy our time and effort. But I think unless you have a set of values, a set of core values that influences and um, influences everything else that you do, then oftentimes you can find yourself in a, in a situation where, you know, you, you wish you weren't or so you kind of say, how did I, how did I get here? How did I, right. you know, I'm either failing this class or behind bars or in trouble with the law. You know, that doesn't happen overnight. Uh, it's oftentimes a series of small decisions that happen over time and cumulatively. Yeah. And, uh, you yeah. know, yeah. So uh, let's let's move forward and let's talk a little bit about about your sport, um, your team sport. Uh, you say that, at least I, I believe you think that when you say that health is a team sport, what does that mean? Because you know health is very important, and people avoid or ignore their health because of the insurance situations, because of the fact that going to a doctor today or getting uh, various things done are just way too outrageous and expensive. And, right. and you know, the Obama plan, I, I'd like just to know a little bit about what you thought about the Obama plan and our uh, situation with health insurance today. Mm. Oftentimes it's said health care is very expensive and and the response to that is we'll try being sick. You know, the, the U.S. is you, you know, most folks who, most individuals who file for bankruptcy, a disproportionate number of those individuals file for uh, bankruptcy, have financial hardship related to uh, health care uh, bills and their inability to uh, pay for um, a hospital, an extended hospital stay, uh, chronic illness of of a loved one. I think the um, Affordable Care Act and the Obamacare, uh, if you will, provided uh, a safety net, somewhat of a safety net to uh, uh, individuals. I, I wasn't particularly uh, excited over the, the mandate um, associated with that, but I, I do think uh, it, was a, it was a first step in providing a minimal amount of care are providing a, a floor to uh, citizens. Ultimately, uh, the uh, health care of an individual, health care of a family, community um, starts with the with the individual. When I say health care is a team sport, when I think about health and talk about health, it is not only the absence of disease or injury, um, but it also is the ability to uh, function at an optimal uh, level. So it, it also... In, involves wellness and a sense of, of well-being, and it, it does take a uh, community to uh, achieve that. And, and and I use the term health very broadly, not only uh, physical health, but the mental health, financial health, and uh, you know everyone plays a role and and, and has a part in that. Yeah, I hear you. You know, um, people talk about uh, all different aspects of health today in terms of um, the combination of regular uh, advice that you can give with regard to health. And sometimes they talk about alternative health. Um, And I'm talking about really alternative health with regard to, for example, offering music therapy, uh, various other things in the hospital, which, you know, don't really infringe on the medicine that you take, but they're just a way to kind of, in fact, mentally, um, you know, improve your health. Uh, when you have those kinds of things uh, in the hospital, it seems to me that if you had bedside uh, music, if you had um, some respite that you create for the parents or the the, the spouses of people whose um, whose children are very ill or uh, their spouses are very ill as well. So, what do you think of alternative medicine? I think it has a role. I, I like the term conjunctive medicine or uh, adjunctive uh, medicine um, therapies that are used uh, in addition to uh, what we traditionally uh, use. Oftentimes, you know, we talked about this placebo effect in medicine, and it is um, 
a result, a positive result that can't be uh, explained by a specific uh, intervention that we can measure. And so um, there's more evidence uh, to suggest that that quote unquote placebo uh, oftentimes is measured by thoughts of well-being, expectation, intention of having uh, a positive outcome, confidence, uh, faith in the uh, provider, um, one's uh, ability to uh, be plugged in uh, in the uh, community, um, having a sense of purpose. Uh, we find that all things being equal as far as the patient demographic, their disease, uh, diagnosis, intervention, all things being equal, an individual that has a pos more positive outlook and has a higher level of expectation, ten, uh, they tend to do better. As yeah. far as the you know, animal therapy, music therapy, all of that uh, plays uh, a role. And many hospitals have uh, adopted uh, music therapy, uh, animals, um, uh, you know, especially at children's hospitals, uh, et cetera, coming in to... Uh, raise the mood, raise the level of expectation uh, of a patient. I mean, you can even say the same thing for a celebrity or, you know, a musician, an athlete visiting uh, an individual at a, at a hospital. Wow. Yeah. You know, it, it's the same effect. Yeah. You know, let's get to something which is a little more, uh, how shall I say, a little bit more optimistic about um, the possibilities of people who just have this desire uh, to improve their behavior all, you know, and of course sports is something that I, I virtually think that there is not one person in our audience who doesn't like sports. Now, you um, you say that you know of no other black medical doctor who has played professional football. Tell our audience a little bit how you got involved in that and what it felt like to be in a with a team playing like that. Yeah, I was drafted to play in the NFL three weeks after being accepted to medical school, and uh, Harvard was uh, gracious enough to offer me a deferment. So once I uh, finished my last football game in the Citrus Bowl uh, in Orlando, started my medical school interviews, and uh, Harvard said, you know, during that process, I said, I may have the chance to play in the NFL. I'm also mm -hmm. training for the NFL Combine. I had a young family to support and doing research, and so I had a, a relatively busy schedule. Um, after being um, uh, accepted to medical school, I said, that's it. I got into a great medical school. I'm not interviewing anymore. And um, I kind of crossed my fingers and, and you know, hoped to, to be drafted and, and was fortunate enough to, to do that. Um, I played for a portion of the uh, season, um, and this is when the Rams were in L.A. the, uh, the first time, and I re recall uh, um, this Ferrari Testarossa in the parking lot, and uh, I said, Who whose car is that? And I had already decided I was going to pursue orthopedic surgery, uh, given my experiences in sports, and they were like, oh, that's, that's the team uh, physician. Uh, for the, and I was like, oh my goodness, I gotta, I gotta get to medical school, and which is you know my my long term term goal. So um, I'm fortunate enough to have that as a, um, you know, to have that that option. Yeah, um, kind of, it was a stepping stone. In sure, some... sure. No, I'm, I'm agreeing. Um, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think that's a phenomenal thing, and people must have been so jealous of you. Um, and, you know, my God, to have the experience to be on a team like the Rams and then also pursue your career, which is, of course, in orthopedics. Wow, that is really amazing. Now, let's sure. get, let's kind of move on again, and let's talk about a book that you're going to release next year called How to Make the Cut. How do you always seem to have made the cut? How did you do that? Well, uh, the title draws on my experiences as an athlete and a surgeon and sharing lessons that I've learned from failures, from uh, experiences uh, that I've had that have allowed me to uh, grow and uh, improve. You know, there was a period of time 
where I wasn't always making the, the cut. And this is, is something that I have to work on uh, daily. And uh, I, I think it's a, a matter of forming habits. I know of a lot of people who go through school and medical school and then suddenly they decide that they have to leave it because it's so hard. So I would like to know a little bit, or I'd like to hear a story that you have from an experience that you had when you started in Harvard and <clears throat> and wound up to be a, an orthopedic surgeon. There must be some kind of funny thing that happened to you, as, and if it is, tell me about it. Yeah. Um, you know, Harvard was very good in that they they did say, you know, anyone can tell a story of how they flunked out of Harvard Medical School. And they said, you know, um, getting in is the hard part. And so they, they said, if we didn't believe that you were able to finish, then we won't let, we won't allow you to start. So those who, who who were accepted, they have a lot of resources. People have different learning styles, and so they they did everything they could to number one bring in the top. Well, they felt were the top uh, students and fit their culture, um, and then they had a number of resources to ensure that you you graduated. Um, you know, it's it, I I kind of nothing. I, I guess comes to comes to mind uh, immediately uh, regarding the um, experiences. I well, I, there's one one experience at uh, Children's Hospital where um, I one of my classmates was <laughs> was Mr. Kansas. He was a bodybuilder and uh, uh, really big guy and a Native American. Uh, gentleman in long hair, ponytail, and then myself, and we were um, just starting our uh, uh, pediatrics rotation as third-year medical students at uh, Boston uh, Children's Hospital. And uh, we, because of our size and, and presence, I mean, we immediately kicked it off with the with the patients. When we first walked onto the ward. Uh, nurses, when we checked in, didn't didn't believe that we were medical students. <laughs> they they thought we were anything but medical students. Yeah, that's so funny. You know, I, I just want to stop you for a minute because, you know, I, when you were talking about this story, and I want you to finish it, it reminded me of the odd couple. I was thinking this has got to be the oddest couple around who are really doing some amazing things. Um, wouldn't you say that is true? I mean, <laughs> sure, very... sure. Go ahead. I mean, that, that was the one, that was the one thing that I loved about my, my classmates. And we, there was uh, such a diversity of individuals that had uh, a wide range of, of accomplishment. Um, you know, I, I guess there wasn't so much to that story other than just kind of recalling, Calling that um, uh, experience, um, you know, I, I had a classmate who was uh, 18 years old and uh, admitted into the MD PhD program, and used to r- ride a skateboard around the quad, and and he was he was a, essentially a, a kid, but but brilliant, and uh, um, and I know he had, was accepted two years earlier, had a Navy SEAL, a former Navy SEAL as a, a classmate, a uh, single mom who had. Um, put herself, uh, you know, through school right. uh, after divorce, and and so basically surrounded by uh, individuals who were in their own right, you know, making the cut and had these uh, created these habits of achievement and uh, a way of doing things that uh, would allow them to um, make it through. Because as you said. It, Medical school, uh, many professional uh, schools and training can be very challenging. So, you know, what do you pull from? What do you draw from That's right. uh, that allows you to make it through those difficult times? Yeah. Now, you, um, you're involved in some projects uh, that improve one's health. I'd like to know what those projects are so people can understand a little bit more about what you're doing and what you're thinking about and what, where, um, where the future lies in medicine. So tell us a little bit about that as well. 
Sure. Well, I'm involved with a, a couple of different uh, startups. Uh, one uh, is uh, telemedicine, telehealth uh, software that uh, focuses on the uh, CDC, the Centers for Disease Control uh, Diabetes uh, Prevention Program. So it allows uh, nutritionists, uh, dietitians, providers to uh, educate uh, individuals on uh, diabetes uh, prevention, uh, making better uh, food choices, uh, exercising more, provides a level of accountability. And one of the benefits, additional benefits, is that uh, you don't have to be right there in person. So uh, you can have a, a little bit larger group setting. Uh, it can be done remotely, uh, face-to-face. Uh, there's an app associated with it. So it's like having a provider right there in your pocket. So if you go to a restaurant, take a picture of, you know, uh, the menu or what your food choice is, and right. you can get immediate feedback on doing things, uh, you know, making better choices. I also involved uh, with a couple of uh, joint replacement uh, technologies uh, specifically for the wrist and foot and ankle uh, that we're uh, working to commercialize. I'm also a big uh, proponent and believer in uh, food as medicine and uh, the importance of, uh, again, making uh, healthier uh, food choices. So uh, there's a technology that we're also commercializing uh, related to uh, increasing the absorption and the bioavailability of uh, curcumin, which is the uh, active ingredient in turmeric. It has a lot of uh, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant uh, capabilities, and uh, we're looking to introduce that in a number of different uh, segments from uh, pharmaceuticals, you know, as a non-opioid alternative, which is, you know, the opioid epidemic is another conversation, uh, as well as uh, food and beverage, um, nutraceuticals, cosmetics, et cetera. So there's a couple of different projects. Yeah, um, believe it. Uh, <laughs> if if we talked all about all of these different things that you're doing, we really need to do it on another show, because you're involved in some things that are really incredible, and it's the future of of medicine and it's the future of health. So. Um, to sum it all up, okay, so I always like to give my, uh, my guests the last word. What is it that you would like to tell the audience and leave them uh, with, you know, the whole notion that there is real possibilities for the future that are going to really uh, kind of be a, a, a time uh, where we don't have to think so much about cancer and heart attacks and diabetes and that sort of thing? I think the limit is is only in what we can think. It's only in our, our thought process. You know, there are many possibilities, and we, we move from what is possible to what is probable to what is certain. And, and in making that shift, we have to address our fears, get out of our comfort zone, ask questions, collaborate, cooperate, uh, challenge each other. And, and many of the challenges that we face, many of, many of the questions that we face uh, today, there's the solutions are there. And it's just a matter of time before we realize those uh, solutions. So, and everyone is going to play a role uh, in that. Some people, <laughs> some individuals, unfortunately, will have uh, um, maybe somewhat of a, a negative uh, impact. Others, you know, many others, my hope is that it will have a positive impact and, and be on the side of uh, growth and, and contribution. But, um, I mean, that's what life is about, growth and, and contribution for me uh, at the end of the day. Yeah, it sounds fantastic. Well, if people want to get in touch with you, Patrick Tyrants, uh, Dr. Patrick Henry Tyrants, how do they do that? Is there a way for them to know where you're located, um, what you're doing, uh, call you for some advice, or whatever the case might be? But we, they need to know where you're located and, you know, and how they get in touch with you. Sure. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm with uh, All Pro Orthopedics in uh, South Florida, 
and uh, we have a website, allproorthopedics.com. I have a, um, a personal website that um, will have all of my activities and things that I'm involved in, and that is drpatricktyrants.com. Uh, I'll have uh, contact uh, information, uh, information there. Uh, my, uh, I'm working with uh, an agent, a uh, uh, woman that uh, you're, you're able to get a hold of, and uh, her uh, number is uh, 673-532-680. She's in, in France, and so uh, the numbers are have, uh, you know, different numbers, but her name is uh, Silver Wayne House, and you can contact her as well. Well, it's been a tremendous, tremendous um, opportunity to interview you, Patrick, because you have so much to share with our audience, and you've got such great morals and ethics, and you really understand what's needed out there. So I want to thank you so much for being on my show, and next time, let's, let's get back and let's talk about all these different things, and let's talk again about your book, uh, because maybe at that particular time, it'll almost be ready. So it's yeah. been a total pleasure. Uh, and I, I want to say to you, you know what, this is what I love to hear from doctors who are, you know, doing all these great things because people need that sort of sense of being aware that there are people out there like yourself who want to give them the most. They want to really help them, and they care about them. So thank you. Thank you, Susan. I appreciate you having me on your show, and I look forward to speaking with you again. Back in my day, to become an author, you had to master your craft. You needed a team that you could trust, a team that would never flinch in battle. Back in my day, you would risk losing your rights and pay outrageous amounts for terrible service. Well, yesterday is not today. Gladiator Publishing Company has a century-long reputation for defending writers and readers and winning awards for their record-setting low-cost services and market sales. They are 75 to 80% more cost effective and never touch your royalties or copyrights. Go with a publisher that is so transparent that they have their contract on their webpage. Have your book treated with honesty, loyalty, and respect, period. Visit us at gladiatorpublishing.com or text us at 417-291-9162. Thank you for listening to The Susan Brender Show. To be a guest, email sebrender at yahoo.com.